So now um, there's a few um, open research areas in, in the field where, where the field is currently heading towards and things that we haven't really answered yet. And so one of these questions is what are, given that we can look at all the data and, and you know, parameterized models in time and frequency and whatever, the question becomes, what are the fundamental limits in terms of accuracy, you know, how many percent correct you get, with our current EEG sensors, sensor technology? For a given number of channels and a certain coverage, how much can you actually squeeze, squeeze out fundamentally, you know, regardless, with the best possible method? And given a certain signal-to-noise ratio of, of the electrodes, for example, and things like that. And uh, when we know the limits, or how far are we from these limits with the mathematical approaches that we're having right now? Are they, you know, it's what you see when you're looking at many studies over time, um, there's some kind of a asymptote that approaches, you know, it's getting better and better, but it's not approaching 100% accuracy. <laughs> it's approaching maybe 90% or 95% accuracy uh, across many labs in, in the BCI field. So we don't really know where that remaining discre discrepancy comes from. Is it we still don't have the right algorithm? Is it EEG is fundamentally too noisy to get to 100% or so? Um, we don't really have the answer. Or is it because we're not using enough data and so on? To answer these questions, what we basically need is a, is a model or type of approach where we can prove that what comes out is optimal under the assumptions that we made. Because then we know. Um, you know, if, if the assumptions are agreeable, we know that there's nothing in the data or there's only so much in the data. Uh, if you're using something that doesn't have this guarantee, um, you know, there's always a second possible answer. So some of the subfields where people are trying to push the boundaries of what's possible are uh, models that are, in a sense, hierarchical. So this is one way to try to improve the performance further. Um, if you're learning across multiple people and multiple sessions and so on, Obviously, you're integrating much more data into your solution. In fact, you're integrating all the data that you can get hold of. And there's a, there's a reasonable chance that we can further improve um, you know, the quality of our solutions by just using all this extra information. And importantly, having that data allows you to fit more parameters, more precise, um, precisely resolved representations, for example. And so we can afford to also basically have more complex models, such as effective connectivity and so on if we have enough subjects to fit it. The other area uh, is to include uh, more neuroscientific prior knowledge um, that can be um, from the book, you know, brain atlases, or just fundamental prior knowledge that is known in the literature. Or it can come from databases like function and anatomic atlases and so on. A third area that is orthogonal to all the others is to include auxiliary measures, not just EEG, but to include things like motion capture, or eye tracking, or the whatever, um, chemical parameters, uh, skin conductance, and whatever. So this auxiliary data, of course, gives you extra information. It can put the EEG measures and brain signals into some sort of context. It also includes, of course, context from the program that the person is interacting with and so on. Say, you know, what speed is a vehicle driving at? That tells you something about the degree of shaking and the degree of artifacts and stuff like that. So all of that are avenues that allow you to push the performance further. And um, with all that data, uh, it, it's very tempting and easy to, to cobble things together at random. <laughs> so it's important to actually still continue to design methods that are, in some sense, principled, where you know why you're making certain choices, and of course, also probably optimal under some principled assumptions. Um, and furthermore, there's the, the world of the lab environment where you're having very controlled tasks and the person is in very controlled environments and so on. And there's the so-called real world where you have things like outliers, you have artifacts and so on and so on. And it's of course important to aim at real world performance and to bridge the gap appropriately, which is easily overlooked if you're only looking ever at clean and, and perfectly sane data. So you need to have robustness in there. And robustness ultimately translates into extra terms and your methods and so on. So it necessarily uh, folds into uh, the design of the methods. And so that's another area where people are trying to push the bar. There is uh, several schools uh, 
to that effect uh, in, in the BCI field and machine learning field and so on, some of which we haven't really covered very much because of lack of time. So uh, there is generally Bayesian approaches to everything that I said. In many cases, uh, the models that we discussed, such as the convex optimization models, can be directly interpreted from a Bayesian point of view as so-called maximum a posteriori solutions. And uh, the, so from the Bayesian school, you get um, certain kinds of modeling tools like graphical models uh, and inference algorithms appropriately for that variation of inference, for example, and so on. And very straightforward alternatives to, to deciding on the complexity of a model. Whereas we talked about cross-validation and things like that and regularization. In the Bayesian framework, you can still use this. But more importantly, there's an entirely principled way to find what the right co capacity of the model should be using Bayesian model selection. Also, uh, by the way, I should say that, that these things connect to optimization also. So for example, variation and inference is ultimately an optimization problem, but a different form of problem. Then we didn't cover um, existing approaches that go across multiple subjects. So there is quite some literature cropping up now. There's papers from, from 2010 and 2011 on that. We haven't really discussed beamforming, which is fundamentally a way to get source estimates. We've talked about ICA. We have not discussed very much the connectivity-based approaches. So again, we have new work on that. There's other people who are working on that. And also, we have only covered certain kinds of well-understood signal features. We've talked about oscillations, ERPs, usually linear measures of those things. We've talked about connectivity a bit. Um, there's other stuff. Uh, there's as many features as there's um, scientists <laughs> coming up with those, um, like and the entropy or so, or the path length, or number of zero crossings per unit of time, or stuff like that. So these can all get you somewhere, of course, um, if you understand what you're doing with those. Lastly, at the end of the day, um, a few things that, that have become clear already over the last years is, despite all that, um, Simple and fast methods, there's some merit to that, you know. Um, so they often work pretty remarkably well on your data, like simple linear discriminant analysis or so. And um, it's, of course, also, you know, much easier to get to the paper stage if it takes you five seconds to test an approach as opposed to five hours or so. And you need a cluster that you compete over with, with your colleagues. So that's important. But on the other hand, of course, if you're looking at an approach that takes five hours a day, that's something that was absolutely impossible, say, 10 years ago. And so whatever you discover with that is likely stuff that hasn't been discovered before. So that's one of the reasons why we're pushing, and other people are pushing, into these high-end expensive methods, it's just fundamentally new territory. Uh, one thing that I've, that I've basically indicated many, many times throughout the lecture is that you cannot oversee how important it is to be clear about assumptions that you're making and explicit about it and build them into your models in, in a principled manner and so on, in, as opposed to getting kind of carried away with, oh, what changes, you know, if I, if I change this multiplication into a division, or if I use, you know, a different fancy flavor of support vector machines on this and that, um, <laughs> without really, or kernel methods or so, without really understanding what it actually means, you know, what kind of feature does it actually extract or so. So um, it's just relevant to, to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and, and as I said, you know, if you have optimal methods, you can test your assumptions directly. So <laughs> the last one is um, it's when you're quantifying how well a BCI solution works, it's very easy to be not entirely principled in how you evaluate that. So it's very easy to cross-validate this incorrectly, for example, to test on the training data. It's easy to use randomized um, testing procedures which don't entirely apply to time series data and so on. But if you do that, um, ultimately you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot because then you are hampered in your ability to improve your own methods, of course, if you lie to yourself. So it ultimately slows down your progress. You, you can't improve what you can measure in a sense. So you always want to do and use the most, the, the most um, you know, closest to the truth measure to evaluate how well your things work that you can come up with, even if it leads to bad, you know, worse numbers in the paper. And so, and so um, that ends uh, the concluding remarks.